Good morning, everybody. Welcome back. It's always fun hanging out in the chat with you guys before the show starts. And um, hopefully you guys all had a restful weekend. Today we're going to be breaking down the first half of a very peculiar book called Baron's Marvelous Underground Journey. Now, up to this point, I didn't really have a whole lot of reason to do a deep dive into this book. But we had made some basic observations a couple years ago. But here's what made me pick this back up again. One of you reminded me that Baron's Underground Journey had been compared to Gulliver's Travels. Now, here's the thing. The artist that did the background scenes in the 1939 Gulliver Travels film, he also painted the patio at Mar-a-Lago. Thump's Florida mansion. And here are some images from that particular painting. Here it is right here. This was this is actually from the dining room, but this was probably likely, this mural was likely also painted by the same artist. His name is Louis Jambor. And as you can see, it is a scene of a shipwreck, which of course was the central theme in Gulliver's Travels. Now, Louis Jambor, this artist, this is actually uh, the dining room, one of the dining rooms from Mar-a-Lago. Louis Jambor also painted murals for Edison's Hotel and the Tesla's Wyndham New Yorker. So there are some connections here, aren't there? Between Barron's Underground Adventure book and the Thump family. So I began reading through this book page by page to see if there were any other references. And what I found were direct references to many of the things that we had covered in other decodes surrounding the Thump family. Portals, magnetism, electricity, funnels, spirals, nested realities, and Worlds within worlds. Now, understand that this book is acknowledged even by the mainstream as some kind of bizarre, I guess you call it an art imitating life occurrence. So, we're going to dig even deeper. Not just on the surface, not just with the name synchronicities. Because there is a Donald character in there that is the father of Baron. As you can see here in this Wikipedia article. There's a Thump Tower reference. A Castle Thump is what they call it in the book. We're going to get even deeper. And this uh, analysis will basically serve as a historical record. That hasn't been done before. So I'm excited about this, and I did find a lot of stuff, and that's what we're going to cover today. But before we do, the first thing I want to do is show you what I found in a particular movie called Gulliver's Travels. Because I wanted to see if there were any other theatrical remakes of Gulliver's Travels. Because the one that the original one was from 1939. Sure enough, I found... The remake with Jack Black in it. This was from 2010. Many of you will remember this film. Gulliver's Travels with Jack Black. It did pretty well in the box office. But it didn't get very good reviews. And I found some stuff in there. That was just pretty crazy. Because it's all about portals. And funnels. And spirals. And everything else we've been talking about. So let's take a look at this. What you're going to see are clear depictions of Shiva, the destroyer. Shiva also opens portals. Okay. And that's why she is pictured at CERN. There's a giant Shiva statue because that's exactly what they're trying to do there is open up portals to hell. So it's kind of interesting that this would appear in Gulliver's Travel. Let's take a look at this. 
There it is right there. Shiva appears. Now, there's a whole plot line to this. and We're not here to really get into Gulliver's Travels, the movie with Jack Black in it. But I wanted to show you some of the symbolism from the film. As just before he goes off on this journey to the Bermuda Triangle, which again is another portal, to write a story, to be a travel writer, to impress this girl, right? But he has really no idea what he's doing because he's just a mailroom clerk. Wow. I am so impressed, Gulliver. I had no idea you were such a good writer. So here is your column basalt tree stump symbolism. These twisted portals that once reached the heavens. But in this case, it is a water spout, a water funnel. And this is what draws Jack Black into this portal and how he ends up in the land of Lilliput. Remember the column basalt we've talked about so many times that these are actually tree stumps, portals? Well, this becomes his prison once he shipwrecks on the island. You see the clear images of the column basalt. So that's pretty much the, that's what I wanted to show you, just to set the scene, to show you that you know when as we talk about these portals, we're not just you know pulling stuff out of thin air. This is very real. Now. Let's get into this book. Now, this is from the Library of Congress. So I pulled these original images off of here. We're going to go through several of these pages within the first hundred pages. So you guys can see what's going on here. Now, our first part of the journey begins with this description on page 11 of the lineage of Baron Trump. Let's read this. It says, as doubting Thomases seem to take a particular pleasure in popping up on all occasions, Jack in the box like, it might be well to head off, head them off in this particular instance by proving that Baron Trump was a real Baron and not a mere Baron of the mind. The family was originally French Huguenot. De la Trump, which Upon the revocation of the Edict of Nantes in 1685, took refuge in Holland, where its head assumed the name of Vander Troop, just as many of the other French Protestants rendered their names in Dutch. So we have this, this bizarre connection of the, these name changes, right? And which we do know happened, used to be Trump. Used to be all kinds of different names before he settled on Trump, right? And now all of a sudden, we have this 1890s book with these very specific entries in it. Now, the French Huguenot connection is pretty crazy because Thump actually has a building. The Trump Plaza in New Rochelle is on Huguenot Street. As you can see right here, 175 Huguenot Street. Now, we did a whole analysis on this Huguenot connection a long time ago about the Thumb family, and it does go deeper. Links into all kinds of stuff related to time travel. The Huguenots were actually mentioned in the time travel series called Outlander, and that pretty much was a, a biographical story of the Thumb family. His mother was actually born near those standing stones at Cowanish from that series. But something else happened here in New Rochelle. Many of you remember we did a drive through in New Rochelle because that was the first place where they basically set up a quarantine zone. Remember that? They were practicing and Thump was working with the governor and basically... Getting ready for the lockdown happened on Friday the 13th, actually, is when that lockdown happened. I think it was locked down for 13 days. 
something to that effect. And I was warning you guys about this, that, hey, look out, um, this will be the rest of our life if we don't stand up and say something now. Drove right through the zone, and um, he has a building there, so that's probably why he chose that area to do the quarantine zone. Hindsight really is 2020, isn't it? There was actually a uh, some kind of, um, uh, what do you call it? Christianing of the building as well. There's actually video of that and the first Christian of the building, I guess, back in 2007. So let's keep going with this because there's more. Now, Baron in the story has a dog named Bulger. And Bulger begs Baron to leave Trump Castle and go on this journey to find a portal. To a world within a world. Let's go to page 24 and read about this. Now we talked all about this nested reality, worlds within worlds. Remember? Oh, well, here it is. To my dear four-footed foster brother, as you may remember, dear friends, my brain is a very active one. Let's make that a little bit bigger for you guys. This interface is kind of weird. And I become interested in a subject. Castle Trump itself might take fire and burn into the legs of my chair and become charred before I would hear the noise and confusion or even smell the smoke. Now this is weird because I was just watching a, um, a video from Shaking My Head Productions and there, and there was Hulk Hogan talking about a burning Trump Tower and and Trump being like coming out of the fire of it or something like this. Do you guys remember that? Hulk Hogan was giving this speech about Trump and burning and Trump coming out of a burning building. It was weird. And here we are and they're talking about, you know, this burning Castle Trump once again. From this 1890 novel. And let's keep reading. It so happened at the time of Bulger's low spirits, now this is his dog, that the elder baron had, through the kindness of an old school friend, come into possession of a 15th century manuscript from the pen of a no less celebrated thinker and philosopher than the learned Spaniard Don Castiano Bartomello, whatever his name is, commonly known among scholars as Don Thumb, entitled A World Within a World. In this book, Don Thumb advanced the wonderful theory that there is every reason to believe that the interior of our world is inhabited. That as is well known, this vast earth ball, I don't believe in that, but is not solid, on the contrary, being in many places quite hollow. That ages and ages are ago, terrible disturbances had taken place on its surface and had driven the inhabitants to seek refuge in these vast underground chambers. So vast, in fact, as well, to merit the name of world within a world. Now, I do believe that there is a subterranean area. It's the... Inner eye earth cosmology, I guess you can call it. It's shaped like an eye, an eyeball, let's call it. And um, underneath our ground here is another subterranean world. Okay. We saw this in King Kong. Same type of effect going on there. And this is where the devil is. It's Sheol. It's the underworld. And we're... Spirits are being held. Things like this. Now this also could be a place where uh, souls are stored until the coming Christ. Think about it. Think, we go into the grave. We go into the ground, right? And then when Jesus comes back, the dead in Christ will be raised first. And everybody knows the rest of the story. We'll be caught up together with him in the clouds. Let's keep reading this. It says, this book with its crumpled, torn, and time-stained leaves 
exhaling the orders of vaulted crypt and worm-eaten chest, exercise a particular fascination upon me. All day long and often far into the night, I sat poring over its musty and mildewed pages, quite forgetful of this surface world, and with the plummet of thought sounding these subterranean depths, and with the eye and the ear of the fancy, visiting them and gazing upon, listening to the dwellers. While I would be thus engaged, Bulger's favorite position was on a quaintly embroidered leather cushion brought from the Orient by me on one of my journeys and now placed on the end of my work table nearest the window. So, Bulger wants Baron to leave the castle and go and examine and look to see if he could find this world within a world, this nested world. Right? Let's keep going. Page 26. Now this whole book is numbered 266 pages according to the Library of Congress. Okay, um, But the actual book doesn't number that way. But there are blank pages and stuff in here. So that's kind of weird though, right? 266, 66 floor penthouse at Thumb Tower. You know, there's, there's a lot going on with this here. So let's hop over to page... 26 and read more about this and and i thought so too and did all in my power to comfort my unhappy little friend but judge of my surprise upon reaching my room directing him to take his place on his cushion to see him refuse to obey it was something extraordinary he was gone for several moments then returned bearing his mouth a pair of oriental shoes and this is the iconic picture you see from this book of baron wearing this like oriental costume everyone's seen the picture and baron puts it on little master can't thou not understand thy dear bulger he is weary of the dull and spiritless existence he is tired of this increasing familiarity on the part of his of these mongrel curs of the neighborhood some of the vernacular in here is unfamiliar but you get the gist of what they're talking about. He implores thee to break away from this life of reverie and inaction. And for the honor of the trumps to be up and away again, stooping down, winding my arms around my dear Bulger, I cried out. So, as you can see here, he wants him to leave the castle and find the world within a world. He says, I understand thee now, faithful companion, and I promise thee that before this moon has filled her horns, we shall once more turn our backs on Castle Trump up and away in the search of the portals to Don Fum's world within a world. Upon hearing these words, Bulger broke into the wildest, maddest barking. So there they go on this journey. Now, the journey takes them through northern russia Let's skip to that page so you guys can see this make sure we're, you guys are with me okay good and as you can as you just heard me read they describe these as portals now it gets more specific because there's lots of different kinds of portals in this case this portal is a twisting winding passageway Don Fum's Mysterious Directions. Bulger and I set out for Petersburg and then proceed to Archangel. The story of our journey as far as Illich on the Illich, Ivan the Teamster, how we made our way northward in search of the portals to the world within a world, Ivan's threat, Bulger's distrust of the man, and other things. So this is just a summary at the top here of chapter 2. According to the learned Don Fum's manuscript, the portals to the world within a world were situated somewhere in northern Russia. Possibly, so he thought, from all indications, somewhere on the westerly slope of the upper Urals. But the great thinker could not locate them with any accuracy. So, near the Arctic. Interesting, right? Northern Russia. Now, they mention another place called a Giant's Well. So, Giant's Causeway, 
you know, all these giant references relating to portals. Well, there's a giant's well as well. <laughs> Let's go to page 41 here and read about the giant's well. Judge of their amazement, dear friends, as their eyes fell upon the calm and skillful driver bracing himself on the front seat and with oft-repeated backward toss of his head urging those horses to bear his beloved master further. So they caught a ride with this guy. I think this is the part. They ended up catching a ride with this Ivan character that they met up with in Russia to take them closer and closer to this world within a world. And... So during this conversation, it says, St. Nicholas, save us, cried one of the peasants, devoutly making the sign of the cross. But if I should live long enough to fill the giant's well with pebbles, I never would expect to see the likes of it again. So they start talking about this giant's well along this highway. Now, somewhere in here, they start talking about a road. Um... <clears throat> they call it a marble highway. And we'll get into that a little bit later. But this is starting to shape up to sound a lot like the Wizard of Oz, isn't it? But here's the problem. This novel came out in 1890. 1889 and 1893. We'll probably also take a look at the other novel as well right now we're looking at the marvelous underground journey but there's another novel called his wonderful dog bulger so that focuses on this but um it's interesting because here you have this boy and his dog walking along a marble highway does this all sound familiar well, look at this this is the Wizard of Oz, which sounds exactly like the same storyline. Well, Wizard of Oz didn't come out until 1900 is when that book was written. So basically, the Wizard of Oz copied this book. And you'll begin to see as we go through the book. But there are a lot of similarities where they meet different peoples. There's these people called the Mini Monkeys or something like that, which sound like the Munchkins. And everyone's small like them. They meet uh, witches and queens and just bizarre stuff, you guys. Bizarre stuff. So, we're jumping around a little bit here, but I wanted to show you guys that. Now, he enters this place called the Quarry of Demons. Let's go to that page. I understand that a lot of this is doublespeak. These portals that they're opening really are portals to fallen angels, portals to demons, communing with demons, so that they can use this technology and rule over the rest of us. But here, they're going to talk about this quarry of demons. Generally speaking, people with very large heads are fitted out by nature with a pair of rather pipe-stymy legs. But such was not my case. I was blessed with the legs of the sturdiest sort. This is Baron talking here. And found no difficulty in keeping pace with my new four-footed friends, who to my delight were not long in convincing me that they had been there before. Not for an instant did they halt at the fork of the path, but they kept continually on the move. Often passing over stretches of ground. Blah, blah, blah. Let's keep going here. At the last mountainside, we began to look to take on quite another character. The gorges grew narrower, and at times overhanging rocks shut out the sunlight almost entirely. We were entering a region of particular wildness, of fantastic grandeur. I had often read of what travelers termed the quarries of demons in the northern Urals, but never till now had I the faintest notion of what the expression meant. Imagine to yourself the unusual look of ruin and devastation. Now, then we get into arch portals. Talked a lot about that too, haven't we? Well, they're mentioned here in the book. Arch portals. 
wish the interface on this was a little bit better because it's kind of a hassle going through these pages. But so this go on, we continue on here. It says four times its sides of every slab in the post and the pediment, and then turn a mighty torrent through the place and roll and twist and lift them up in wild confusion and on end to the wild waters were builded fantastic portals to temples more fantastic and arched wild gorges with roofs of rock which seemed to hang so lightly that a breath or football footfall sorry might bring them down with terrible crash so he's talking about this scene of this place where these portals exist now let's keep going Because then he reaches the bottom of the giant's well. And he described it as a polyphemous funnel or a portal gate. Let's go to that part. Uh-oh, technical difficulties. Let's refresh that. Just so happens we're doing a live show on this and they're going to have technical difficulties. <laughs> wow hold on you guys let's let's figure this out okay it's thinking let's go back in here while we're trying to wait for this to fix itself unbelievable now we're not even to the best part yet so let's let's try to stick with this you guys okay here we go that was a close one so let's go to page 54 as he reaches the bottom of the giant's well. Okay, we're back. Close one. Again and again did I send my wise and watchful little brother down ahead of me. So he's descending down into this, this, this well, I guess. Until at last standing there and looking up not reminded me of the mighty world mighty outside world but a bright silver speck like a tiny ray of light streaming through a pinhole in the curtains of the chambers but stop have we reached the bottom of the giant's well for with a trial plummet i find that the walls are no longer sheer and they slope inward and gently too almost so much so that i hardly need a line to continue my descent Lighting one of my tapers, I make my way cautiously around the edge. In half an hour, I find myself back at the starting place. The curve to the path has been always the same, while my trial plummet at all times has indicated the same slope to the rocky basin. And then, for the first time, two certain words made use of by that learned master of masters, Don Foam, till then... I, a mystery to me stood out before my eyes as if written with a pen of fire upon those black walls thousands of feet below the great world of light which I had quitted a few hours before. Those words were polyphemus funnel. So he's in a giant tornado funnel like area descending into the giant's well. Pretty descriptive, isn't it? Now, next page, that he describes it as a cone. As well, same concept. My despair upon finding the pipe of the funnel too small for my body. Now here's where things get interesting because Baron can't fit through the portal. But watch what he does next. A ray of hope breaks in upon me, full account of how I, how I succeeded in entering the pipe of the funnel. My passage through it. Bulger's timely aid, the marble highway, and some curious things concerning the entrance to the world within a world. So, the rocky sides of the Polyphenus funnel were apparently as well polished as those of any tin funnel that I had ever been uh, ever seen hanging in the kitchen of Castle Trump. So making fast my, ta my tackle and taking Bulger in my arms, away we were sliding down the side with the line passed under my arm for safety's sake. 
It was nearly 100 feet to the bottom before I had measured off the full length of my line before I had come to the apex of this gigantic cone. So, down through the portal. And you just heard them mention the Marble Highway, and we definitely have a connection to the plot line of The Wizard of Oz. But as we said, The Wizard of Oz had not been written for 10 more years after this book published. Now we're going to get into the electric universe. And this is where we begin to see clues of things that might relate directly to what is happening right now. Now understand that the electric universe was in its infancy in the year 1890 in the real world. And so we have Baron entering this coil pipe. I guess it's a tin pipe, maybe. And of course, coiling is one of the main components of the electric generator. But he gets stuck and he can't go any further. Now that could be a reference to a magnetic polarity. That magnetically he could not pass through. So what does he do? He wraps himself up and he smears black lead all over his body so he can quote unquote fit through the funnel. Now as we read this, understand that lead is diamagnetic. In other words, it repels magnets, powerful magnets, which is exactly what you would need to slip through a magnetic portal. Right? A coiled wire. Think of the copper being coiled the way it was. Let's read this. It was tight as I could bear and change and change the slip knot into a hard one. Then having made the other end of the line fast to the side of the funnel, I proceeded to wind myself up, as housewives often do, a big sausage to keep it from bursting. This done, I set about rolling in the black lead until I was thoroughly smeared of it. There was now but one thing more to do before dropping myself into the pipe, and that was to make fast the weight to my feet. It was no easy task. Wound up as I was, with my arms lashed down against my body, but by the, by the use of the slip knots, I finally accomplished the feat, and sitting down, put my legs into the pipe and drew a long breath, for I felt as if I was skewered up in a straight jacket. Bending down, I called out for Bulger. So he sent Bulger down first. Bulger went through okay because he was a small dog. And then here he comes with this technique that he uses to slide down through this pipe. So he's successful by wiping this lead all over him. So what is this about? Well, lead is diamagnetic. And basically it repels magnets here's actually a video on i think i think i have a video here on it here it is here play just a part of this hi there that's the brass and the lead this guy takes this uh copper so geode no i'm sorry not geode um a neodymium magnet which is a very powerful magnet so that's the aluminium then the brass then the lead and then the copper <laughs> and the G clamp. You'll see it goes slowly over the aluminium, then quicker over the brass, a lot quicker over the lead, and then it slows down again over the copper. And that's because of the different electrical resistivities, the electrical resistance. Uh, the copper has got the, uh, the lowest resistance, uh, then the aluminium, then the brass, and then the lead. And the lower the electrical resistance, the higher the current, the higher the current, the stronger the uh, magnetic field that's produced. So, was Baron smearing this lead all over his body? Was this magnetic in principle? You have to ask yourself. I believe it was. I believe that they were describing a magnetic type of electrical... Um, interface that allowed him to get through this portal and this is the whole basis of this whole trump the time traveler aspect biff 
Biff Tannen. Back to the Future. There's some kind of technology where they're opening portals. So let's keep going with this because there's more. You're going to hear him describe this threading or screwing or revolving motion, which is definitely part of what would be necessary to pass through these portals. Remember, portals are twisted gates is what they pretty much are. Now, a couple of you did a really good job, and maybe you still are as we're having this discussion. You did a really good job showing the scriptures that talk about whirlwinds and tornadoes and pillars of uh, cloud and the different things mentioned all throughout the Bible with reference to portals and different prophets of the Old Testament. So, this isn't just a, a concept that we came up with. There's, this is actually biblical as well. Now, let's keep going with this. Let's read this. It says... My hands wedged so closely to my sides, but at the moment I still had discovered the cause of my coming to such a sudden standstill. I had struck a portion of the pipe that had a thread to it, like that which encircles a bolt of iron and makes a screw of it. And the thought came to me that if I could only succeed in giving a revolving motion to my body, I would, with every tw turn twist myself further down toward the end of the pipe, I could feel that my knuckles and fingers were being bruised and lacerated by this arduous work. But that, but what cared I for the keen pain that darted from the hands to the wrists and wrists to the elbows? It was like twisting a screw slowly through a long nut. Only the thread in this case was on the nut and the grooves in the screw. And the screw was my poor bruised little body. All of a sudden, by the swinging of the weight, I could tell that I had passed out in the lower end of the pipe. So... The polyphemus funnel is an aspect of these portals. Now, he finally gets through this thing and he describes a reptilian. Of course, he would describe a reptilian, right? Because he's descending into the depths of hell, basically, as he's opening this portal. He's going to mention phosphorus and the electric universe. Now, if you're getting confused with the, the page numbers, understand that the Library of Congress numbered this up here. It's indexed here, and this is what I'm going by. So when I mention a page number, it's the, the renumbering that the Library of Congress gave it, not the actual numbers that you're seeing on the physical pages, you see. So let's keep going with this. I made haste to cast away the undergarment with its coating of black lead and resumed my clothing. Then, stooping down, I made an examination of the floor. It was composed of huge blocks of marble of various colors. This is the yellow brick road. Polished almost, almost as smooth as if the hand of man had wrought the work. And then I knew that I was on nature's marble highway leading to the cities of the underworld, which Don Foam had mentioned in his book. And I remembered, too, that he had spoken of nature's mighty mosaics. So it's almost like a rainbow brick road. Huge, fantastic figures of the walls of these lofty corridors made up of various colored blocks and fragments laid one upon the other as if with design and not by the wild, tempestuous whims of an up-bursting forces thousands of years ago when the earth was in its mad and wayward youth. After a rest of several hours, during which I nursed my torn hands and bruised fingers, Bulger and I were up and off again along this broad and glorious marble highway. Strange to say, it was not the inky darkness of the ordinary cavern, which filled this magnificent chambers through which the marble highway went winding in stately and massive grandeur far from it the gloom was tempered by a faint glow that met us on the way ever and anon like a ray of twilight gone astray 
Anyway, Bulger noticed I could see perfectly well. So tying a bit of twine to his collar, I sent him on ahead, convinced that I could have no sure guide. At times, our path would be lighted up for an instant by the bursting out of a little tongue of flame, either on the sides or from the roof of the gallery. I was puzzled for quite a while to tell what it proceeded from, but at last I caught sight of the source, or rather the maker, of this welcome illumination. It proceeded from a lizard-like animal, which, by suddenly uncoiling its tail, had the power to emit this extremely bright flash of phosphorescent light. Now, we know phosphorus is called Lucifer. That is the nickname for the element phosphorus, which is the light bearer. So basically, these like demonic lizard reptilian creatures were providing light as he made his way along the yellow brick road. And it says, for all the world, like the noise of an electric spark. Bulger was delighted with this performance and on one occasion, not a, a, being able to control his feeling. He ut uttered a sharp bark, whereupon apparently 10 thousand of these little torch bearers so a bunch of reptilians crawling around down in here now they go on because they describe this world of electric current okay on page 65 let's go to that a world of electric current is described here let's take a look mysterious glow would return beginning with the softest yellow, then changing from a dozen different tints, and like a fickle maid, uncertain which to wear, put all aside, and don the lily's garb. Bulger and I wandered along the marble highway, almost afraid to break a stillness so deep that it seemed to me as if I could hear those sportive rays of light in their play against the many-colored rocks arching this mighty corridor. Now, as the marble highway swept around in a graceful curve, a dazzling flood of light burst upon us. It was the sunrise in the world within a world. Whence came this flood of dazzling light, which now caused the sides and arching roof to glow and sparkle as if we had suddenly entered into one of nature's vast storehouses of polished gems. It did not take long for me to understand it all. Know then, dear friends, that the ceilings, domes, and our troops of this underground world were fretted with a metal of greater hardness than any known to us children of sunshine. Its seams ran hither and thither like the veins of gigantic leaves, and at certain hours, currents of electricity from vast internal reservoir of nature's own building streamed through these metal traceries until they glowed with a heat so white to give off a flood of dazzling light which I had already spoken the current never seemed never came with a sudden rush or burst but began gentle and timidly so to speak as if feeling its way along hence the beautiful tense it always preceded sunrise in this lower world so the lower world is an electric world what they're describing here is this electricity is, is what lights up the world instead of the sun that's the world they want for us now. They want us to live in this electric kingdom, not God's kingdom. And they're talking about it right here. And this has everything to do with 5G Wiz and what's going to happen in a couple days. The, as the electric kingdom kicks off, the electric fence, it's all connected. Wow. Wow. It says the marble highway now divided in the two halves of the fork curving way to the right and the left enclosed a small but exquisitely exquisitely ornamented park or pleasure ground i might call it but provided with seats of some dark wood beautifully polished and carved this park was ornamented with four fountains each springing from a crystal basin and spreading out into a feathery hmm four fountains is that like the four rivers of the Garden of Eden? See how they're trying to recreate, recreate God's reality, right? Now, it gets creepier because this place where they're at is called 
Goggle Land. Like Google. They talk about white electric light. It's on page 66. Of course, it has to be page 66, right? Let's read about it. Let's make this a little bit bigger so you guys can see this. It's just very touchy, this thing. Okay. Dazzling white light. As Bulger and I directed um, our steps toward one of the benches with the intention of taking a good rest, a low growl from him warned me to be on alert. I gave a second look. A human being was sitting on the bench. Beside myself, as I was with curiosity, I came face to face with the inhabitants of the underworld. The first we had met, I, I made a halt, determined to ascertain if possible whether he was quite harmless before accosting him. He was small in stature and clad entirely in black, sort of loose flowing robe, much like a Roman toga. His head was bare, and what I could see of it was round, smooth, and rosy, with about as much hair or rather fuzz upon it as the head of an infant six weeks old. His face was hidden by a black fan, which he carried in his right hand, and the uses of which you will learn later on. His eyes were shielded from the intense glare of the light by a pair of colored glass goggles. As he raised his hand between me and the light, I, could help ca I couldn't help but catching my breath. I could see right through it. The bones were as clear as amber, and his head, too, was only a little less opaque. Suddenly, two words from Don Fum's manuscript flashed through my mind, and I exclaimed joyously, Bolger, we're in the land of the transparent folk. At the sound of my voice with the little man... Uh, the little man r arose and made a low bow, lowering his fan to his breast where he held it. His baby face was ludicrously sad and solemn. So solemn. Yes, sir, stranger, said he in a low musical voice. Thou art indeed in the land of the Mickey Minkies, the Micah Men, in the land of the transparent folk, called also Goggle Land. But if I should show thee my heart, thou would see that I am deeply pained to think that I should have been the first to bid this welcome for for now, Sir Stranger. So, they're in this land called Goggle Land. Now, this kind of reminded me, this white light, um, a bald guy in a, in wearing all black. This kind of reminded me of this, the construct room in the Matrix. Okay? And Morpheus wears these goggles to, to to shield his eyes from this white light everybody remembers the scene here's another image of it here they're in the construct with the red chairs there's neo the neodymium magnet remember and morpheus with his glasses his goggle like glasses on right weird 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 now let's keep going because there's a couple more pages we're going to go over. Then we're going to take a break. I'm going to go into the chat with you guys. And um, we will pick this up tomorrow. I'll spend the rest of today reading hopefully the rest of the book. And I'll pull out the highlights for you guys. But wow, right? Electric Universe, the white light, the white room. It seems to all be there. Now... We're going to go to page 85. That'll be the last page we cover today. And just like in the Matrix, everybody spends all of their time or most of their time asleep in beds. Like the pods. Let's go take a look. Brief account. Hold on. Of the Doctor Nebulous, Lord Cornicor, Sir Amber Opaque, who tell me many things that I have never knew before, for which I was very grateful. Lord Bulger and I were more pleased with our new friends, although so e eager were they to make us thoroughly comfortable that they overdid matters at times, and left me scarcely a moment to myself in which to make an entry into my notebook. They were extremely solicitous, solicitous, lest in my ignorance I should set down something wrong about them. Okay, let's get to the part we're talking. Okay, 
I feel assured that we shall have a number of visitors from my people every year or so, and I have already issued orders to have extra beds made as soon as the wood can be quarried. Doctor gave us an account of the various ailments which the Mikamingis suffered from. All sickness among our people, little baron, said he, is purely mental or emotional, that is, of the mind or feelings. There is no such thing as bodily infirmity among us. Wine and strong drink are unknown in our world, and the food we eat is light and easily digested. We are never exposed to the dangers of breathing a dust-laden atmosphere, and while we are an active and industrious people, yet we sleep a great deal. For as our laws forbid the use of lamps or torches, except for the use of those toiling in the dark chambers, it is not possible for us to ruin our health by turning night into day. We go to bed the, let's go to the next page here. The very amount that the river of light ceases to flow. The only elements that ever gives a, gives me the least trouble is what they basically call laughing too much. The inclination of being too happy. So they sleep a lot. And it's crazy because they actually describe these beds. They're like benches that turn into beds as they're walking along this highway. These benches just automatically, they just touch them and they turn into beds and then people go to sleep when the sun goes down. So I'm back in the chat now. And um, those were the highlights from the first hundred pages of this underground journey that I thought would be interesting to you guys because it's everything we've been talking about you guys these twisting portals um magnet magnetism the electric universe um it just goes on and on and on and that's the world they're trying to create for us that's the world they're trying to create for us so we'll continue on with that uh for tomorrow's show well, let's go in the chat and see chat and see what you guys are up to. Makes me think of the Wally chair, says says Miner. Okay. Like the cardboard hospital beds that turn into coffins. Absolutely. Thanks, a remnant. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, everybody. So, is there anything I missed? I always like to ask you guys because you guys are smart people. Now, it's interesting that in this electric universe, they have no ailments. I think probably the opposite is true. I think the this electricity going through the air and, and through these caverns of the deep actually do cause ailments. Okay. Now, in the book, these they discover that these people have basically their heart is there's a hole through their chest in which you could see their heart and this they use the fans to cover that hole in their heart because basically you can they can read each other's heart by just looking through the person's chest in their world and the thing about these people is that their hearts count down like a clock and when their time is up, their time is up, and it's fully visible to anyone who they want to reveal it to, and about how much time they have left in their life. And they seem to all be completely okay with that. Now, I didn't go into that aspect of the book, just because there were other things to cover, but I wanted to at least mention it to you. Okay. The G word is also called lead, says Vixie Girl. Yeah, we can't say that word anymore on YouTube. Uh, they've taken down many channels for talking about that. Um, but that's why we don't mention it here. But I wanted to acknowledge your, uh, your comment there. 
Yes, like Logan's Run, the carousel. Yes, John. They would only live to a certain age. It would count down. And then at the end, they would, what would they do? They would spin on the carousel. Wow, that's interesting. That twisting thing again. Portals. Great observation. Okay. All right, you guys, I'm going to go ahead and uh, pop off here. I really appreciate everybody showing up, and hopefully we did this justice. Um, I wanted to just break all that down for you guys. We'll see you guys tomorrow. Have a great rest of your day. Take care and be safe.